You're listening to That Gets My Goat. Never again. So, last week we were talking about Thor. Uh You and I saw Thor. And then we just let the conversation go where it will. And hopefully people find that interesting. Yeah, and we're back at it. Yep. So, So, oh, go. Just, okay, so Thor was interesting in that, it, as far as I know, it's the first film from Marvel Studios with fantasy elements, with magic. And I could be wrong, but this is the fourth movie from Marvel Studios. And Iron Man 1 and 2 and... Incredible Hulk and oh, okay. Thor. It was so memorable I'd forgotten it existed. It sort of opens the door to, the possi- to new possibilities. And that was something that I complained a lot about with Brian Singer's take on the X-Men is just how limited that makes things for cosmic stories, for Mm -hmm. magical stories, for that sort of thing that existed in the X-Men for decades. Right. And, you know, there may be people that like that Iron Man could exist, that Hulk sort of maybe could exist, and they see Thor and they're like, well... That can't exist. Parallel dimensions and other worlds and all that and time travel and that or that, that can't exist. I, I hope not. I hope people just say, well, you know, the story took me along and it'll be fun to see somebody like Iron Man interacting with somebody like Thor in the future. I don't know. Yeah, I think that'll be interesting. They never do this with Superman at all. As far as I've ever seen in any of the movies that they do, they always give you a more quasi-realistic villain or whatever. But my brother-in-law that I mentioned before, that's the big DC guy, will always talk about how, you know, Superman's big weakness is magic. He doesn't do well against magic. magic. And you never see that in any of the movies. And I don't know. I never watched Smallville. I don't know if they come up with magic villains in that. Isn't that Mitsipotsiklitsk's guy supposed to be magical? Or I suppose. I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I thought that he was an alien or just, you know, from another dimension. But, I thought he was like a leprechaun or something. But, yeah, we can say that it's magic. <laughs> He's. They say that Shazam or Captain Marvel, as he can also be known as, his powers come from magic, and so Shazam is always a good person to fight Superman with because he has trouble with him. I don't know. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, that's a, a similar thing, magic that doesn't get explored in any of the films, and I guess maybe it must be just that. I, I know that I really thought X-Men, Brian Singer's X-Men take was really cool because of that, because it almost seemed like it could be something that was real, that there really could be X-Men out there that somehow had these strange powers and, you know, it was all seemed based in reality enough to believe. And it was those X-Men movies that got me into comic books in the first place. So there, there's, there's worth to that, I guess. I don't know. It can bring in new fans and then suddenly they see the wide open world and uh, you're able to do a, a new take. I don't know. Well, I would imagine that somebody that's brought to the X-Men comics by the, the movie franchise would think that the costumes are lame. Or if they see Kitty Pride interacting with an alien dragon, they think that's lame, right? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. You know, you know that the movies are, are, are taking off part, a runway to lift off into the realm of knowing more. Sorry, <laughs> bad metaphor. They're, they're a launch pad, and you head off into the, uh, you know, the, the more rich and the long history you know and you learn about all all sorts of stuff that there are out there i don't know i mean there might be some people that think it's lame those people are more likely to be the people that aren't going to actually ever go and read the comics they're just going to watch the movie and then that's enough for them so well along the same lines christopher nolan's batman universe let's say that they're not going to end it with the next move and they just give it to somebody else and he just has raz al ghul come back and have undead ninja assassins at his disposal, and they introduce a, a boy sidekick and all that, you know, I, I fully expect the fans of the Dark Knight franchise to say, oh, that's all stupid and that's all lame, even though that's how it's supposed to be. Right. I don't know. Maybe, I, maybe I'm too far in the other direction where, you know, I'm so willing to believe that uh, a man can fly 
that you don't have to come up with pseudo scientific reasons for it. And when you do, I just want to punch you in the throat. <laughs> like, okay, so billions of little sharp hairs come out of the tips of Peter's fingers, and that's how he's able to walk on walls. Uh, no, he just can walk on walls because he's like a spider. That's all I've ever needed. <laughs> And, you know, well, he spooges what? out webs from his <laughs> veins. I mean, where is that stuff created from? Does he have like web sacks in his underarms and stuff? No, in his underwear. It's just like, no. <laughs> it's I, created I right in his nuts. That's revolting. Dude. <laughs> Unfortunately, when he uh, gets excited, that's what comes out there, too. It's uh... boojum. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow. Uh... No, no, no. It's boojum. Sorry. The film itself, what did you think of the characters? You know, I wasn't expecting a whole lot. I mean, I, I thought it might be good because, A, you got Kenneth Branagh as the director, and you've got Anthony Hopkins in it, which, you know, those are two pretty well-respected folks in acting and story and, and Shakespearean realms. I, don't I use realms like many times in the show. It must be because they use it in the movie a lot of times. Don't you think it's kind of like getting Marlon Brando to be in your Superman movie? You yeah, know, it's, it's like suddenly this is a real actor. This is an Oscar winning actor. This is a respected thespian in your funny book movie. And, you know, I don't know. I'm not old enough to know what audiences thought when Superman was being made. And they're like, Gene Hackman is Lex Luthor? Still, it's 30 something years later and you're like, Wait, Gene Hackman? Whose idea was that to cast him as Lex Luthor? It's just a given now. I think it's kind of like that. Maybe it helped to give it respect. I don't know. I wasn't expecting a lot from it. I think it's just because it's Thor. He's kind of a side character. He's not somebody to care a whole lot about. So I wouldn't have been extremely let down if it turned out to be crappy. It didn't turn out to be crappy. It was nothing like going to see Daredevil and thinking, yeah, I don't know anything about Daredevil, really, so I won't be let down when it turns out to be crappy. But it turned out to be really crappy <laughs> to the point where I was still let down with Daredevil. But with Thor, it was kind of the opposite. You know, it was it was good. They came up with interesting characters. There was a lot of really good moments in it that I enjoyed a lot. I liked the uh, character arc that they put Thor through did seem like it was a little rushed, unfortunately, but they had so much set up at the start to give you, you know, okay, this happens and then this happens. And, and they had like the prologue, oh, and back in the day, this happened. And they just had a lot of setup to finally get to the story where Thor is cast out of Asgard and now he has to uh, get along as a, as a human. So his change happens quicker than you know it probably would have been better if it, had, if it took longer if it took more time for it to develop so that he had to actually go through several obstacles of uh, becoming a good person before he finally became a good person learned his humility etc but uh all in all it was really it was a really good show i, I liked a lot of the moments in it and um yeah, I don't know if I have any other gripes. Maybe I wanted Loki to be more mischievous. He was devious, you could say. He was a, he was he was tricky, but he was I don't know. I wanted him to be a little more like Mixilpitalic. Yeah, maybe a little more. <laughs> I'm doing this and I'm annoying, so screw you. You know, he needed to be a little more manic. I want to say. Maybe more of a Joker type. I don't know what he's like, though. So maybe I, he was perfect, for all I know. But, uh, you know, I would have liked to see him, I don't know, just doing tricks and playing jokes on people all the time. Maybe that would be too much. Maybe it wouldn't work for the story. I don't know how it would work. But it seems to me like the god of mischief should be more mischievous than, uh, than he was. I mean, he did pull well, a lot of tricks. But they were all like supervillain kind of tricks and not so much just general mischief. Hmm. Okay. Loki was actually the thing I liked most about the movie. Yeah? And yeah, I don't know what he's like in the comics. Maybe I don't want to know because I like this interpretation. Um, and probably when it first started, he was just a troublemaker. But 
you know how they they have to darken things up and make it more serious and and eventually you know he becomes the god of lies rather than of mischief and things like that and so i thought it was apt i understood his personality and his reasoning and uh I didn't feel like he was just bad to be bad, that, that, uh-huh. that he had a personality. And, and I, I found him quite likable, if not sympathetic, you know, understandable. And, and yeah, it was uh, somebody that I'm looking forward to seeing again. When, when you see him at the, the very end, he's got like veins and stuff. And so, I mean, there's some kind of damage. Something has happened to him, uh-huh. right? Which uh, will when be cool to see him again. through the whatever. Yeah, he may have no corporeal form for all we know. And, you know, only be able to influence others as like a, you know, a bad conscience or something like mm. that. I, I I don't know. Maybe he's like the Scarlet Witch and he can make bad luck happen to people. First time I, I think I, I got a issue. It was like X-Men 4 or something like that came with one of the toys that I'd gotten way back in the early days. Her power was she got in the X-Men way by making somebody's suitcase open up and the stuff dumped out and like Jean Grey tripped over the stuff or something. It was the lamest thing ever. It was so unbelievably lame. Just the bad luck powers. <laughs> yeah. It, it, well, that's sort of how Stan's female characters were. It was like they would always be the weakest member of the team, the one with the most useless power. Mm-hmm. Sue can turn invisible. That's it. And uh, Gene can make things float. Right. And it's like, ooh, cool. And uh, You leave it to other writers to come along and expand those powers. Yeah, eventually they they turned Sue incredibly powerful. And Gene Grey, without a doubt, is the most powerful of all the X-Men. I mean, I think she would win in a fight with the Juggernaut or with the Hulk. Stuff like that. And it's where the they Scarlet just have to Witch overcompensate. And Scarlet Witch became so powerful. All powerful. She basically became a god yes, in the Marvel Universe. The world. Which is, is it's, it's interesting. It's something that they've done once and it worked. But probably it was Phoenix that they did it with first and it worked. And so they've done it a bunch of times ever since. I, they gave Sue like a dark phoenix arc where she became a villainess and and certainly scarlet witch became a villainess and it's just something that once it's been done once they they try it again and again and again until i guess it works much less but uh we can look forward to that with the green lanterns where carol ferris eventually becomes a villainess and so uh, it's something to look for when the movie comes out see if there's any foreshadowing of that nah nah well, you never know. Well, they are DC. I was going to say, they're so short-sighted, they're not planning on future films. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. If it doesn't make a billion dollars, they probably won't bother to make a second one. Well, Do you think they'll make a second Thor? Now, we were recording this Monday after opening weekend. The opening weekend take was something like $66 million, yeah. which is low for... I mean, it's lower than Fast and the Furious 5 or Fast 5 or whatever they called it. Right. Okay, well, let's look at it this way. It's a number than Fast 5. It's... It was a smaller opening than Iron Man, smaller opening than Spider-Man, but a bigger opening than X-Men, bigger opening than Fantastic Four, bigger opening than Daredevil or Ghost Rider. So for the first movie in an installment, it's done well. Um, Now, yeah, it's not going to be able to compete with an X-Men sequel or a Spider-Man sequel or an Mm -hmm. Iron Man sequel, but with not having a franchise before it. And, and, you know, that's the thing with Fast and the Furious. It's Fast and the Furious 5. 5. True. And so it's got all these other movies built on it. All these crap movies. Really, really stupid fans that flock to it. (laughs) It it didn't do that significantly less than Fast and the Furious, but it was also in 3D, and Fast and the Furious wasn't. Right. So there's another way to hamper it. But I don't think it did that badly. It did about the same as Incredible Hulk did. Yeah. Well, they didn't make a sequel to The Incredible Hulk. No, Um, they still can. The trouble with the fact that it's a summer movie is you don't... like. If had this movie come out like Christmas, I could see it making a lot of money still. Because, you know, like you and I, we went, we didn't expect a lot. We were pleasantly surprised. It's we, something we'd see again. We came away saying, this is great. I've told several people since I saw it. Yeah, you know, I actually, I really liked it. I, I wasn't expecting a lot, but it was pretty good. And that's word of mouth. That's the kind of thing that builds 
a movie and it eventually makes lots of money. That's the kind of thing that, you know, Titanic lived on was people telling their friends, yeah, you should see this and then going back with their friends and seeing it a second time and a third it's time. It's the opposite of the Hollywood blockbuster yeah, model. That's what I'm saying. But we saw Inception just last year do that word of mouth model and play week after week that's after true. week. And that... That was a blockbuster. Over the the summer, it did that. See, I was going to say it's hard. It'll be hard for Thor to make a lot of money using that word of mouth because the whole summer thing of a new blockbuster every single week, you know. Yeah. It's basically see it the week it comes out because by next week it'll be out of the theaters. You'll only be able to catch the 11.25 a.m. show. If you don't see it then, they don't have room for it anymore because they got to have the next show on 3D screens, on 15 3D screens, you know. And that's very true. There's only so many venues for it. An amazing thing was that Fast Five opened on like 300 IMAX screens. And the next week... 20. Yeah. Oh, so you know this. I did see they that, were, yeah. They, yeah. The vast majority of those screens were gone in seven yeah, days. They went to Thor. And so uh, that's something that's going to hamper it. Hopefully, they can keep the momentum up. And when Captain America comes out, you'll be able to see both. I would think because Captain America, spoilers, refers to Asgard and refers to things that happen in Thor, you know, there's going to be cross-pollination. It's like, whoa, wow, that's cool. I know that they tried that with Incredible Hulk, having Tony Stark actually shown up in that movie because they were only a couple months apart. Maybe it'll still be playing. But yeah, basically you've got not even seven days. You've got three days and that's it. Yeah, it's just, it's trouble. Maybe it'll still manage to make some money because it was interesting. Like, there's people that would probably see it, like that girl who insists on not being put in the box that, you know, she's into that stuff. Maybe she'll go and see that. Well, um, yeah, and that's good. And it was Fast Five had a 63% drop from week one to week two. And I'm not sure on the numbers exactly, but it seems like it was 63. Which is, I think it was actually 62. Oh, you butthole. <laughs> I would hope that Thor has a smaller drop, but... It will have a drop. In this day and age, you see it the first weekend if you want to see it. Otherwise, you may miss it. Otherwise, there's something new trying to grab your attention, saying, hey, 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 we're opening this week. What opens this week, do you know? Uh, Well, the the direct competition is this movie, Priest, which my prediction is by the time this episode airs, will be long forgotten. I don't think that'll make a dime I can but that's just agree me with that then i believe we get pirates the week after that uh, um yeah, you get bridesmaids to... this friday but that's not really competition with yeah. thor they had uh, the premiere show of uh, pirates this weekend at walt disneyland oh okay they have two weeks until pirates then huh so this upcoming week then they might uh I expect Thor to be number one again this weekend, but unless that Bridesmaids movie makes a ton of money, they're pitching it as Hangover for Women, and that might work, but I... I, That worked great for that one show that you loved, right? It was that show that you wanted me to uh, film my wife's reaction, put a webcam on my wife's face while she watched it. What was that one called? started with an S. I don't... It was a, a flick with Cameron Diaz and Selma Blair in it. Started with an ass. Yeah. The sweetest thing. The sweetest thing, yeah, which was supposed to be... Uh, but I think that was supposed to be... A dirty, raunchy comedy for women. And it turned out women didn't so much want dirty, raunchy comedies. Well, we'll see. I, I think Bridesmaids will do well, but everybody else disagrees. I, we, we, we'll see. I haven't always. heard much about it. but Can't always predict how well these things will do. I, I think... You know, there are people that it's their job to interview people that are going to movie theaters and stuff and asking them, how much are you looking forward to seeing so-and-so? And and are you going to go on opening day? And how old are you? And what's your skin tone? And then they compile these numbers. would you like to go upstairs? (laughs) Oh, you're just here to see Hoodwink 2. Oh, Hoodwink 2, but what's that about going upstairs? (laughs) Nothing. Nothing. So we're wondering, and then they compile these numbers and they make predictions based on them and stuff. And the prediction for Thor was a $65 million opening. Wow. And so normally I would say, you know, these guys don't know what the F they're talking about. Because I think Fast and the Furious was a 70, 72 or something like that. And they did 80. But yeah, Thor dead on 65. So they, they, they must know what they're talking about a little bit. Yeah, it's like those exit polls for election night and stuff where they're interviewing 
certain number of people coming out of the polls and then they uh, extrapolate all those numbers to try and predict who's going to win like at the very start of the day and as the day goes through and sometimes that works and then sometimes you get a state like florida where there's they're still counting yeah they're still counting 10 years later like no way we need to do one more recount because that last one was inconclusive and i think there was two votes separating them i think they were gonna have a runoff (laughs) can you imagine a runoff for the president it's like you know what turns out it was a tie we're gonna have to do that again (laughs) It basically worked that way. It was three or four days before where Gore said, okay, I'm not, I'm not president. But I can't remember. Oh, it was a long, long time ago, but Scream 4 came out. And those same people were saying that that's going to be a 30 to $35 million opening. And it didn't even make 20 its opening weekend. Hmm. And people were just shocked. I was shocked. I mean, it's just amazing. that. It, I mean, that was a significant mess up. Uh, and so I, I don't know if they can predict these things or not. Again, it's like we said either in an upcoming episode or a recent episode. If you could predict how to be successful in stuff with numbers, then people would do it all the time. You can't. Right. But you, Pirates 4 may be a failure. It may make $110 million or whatever, and people go, oh, geez, what the crap happened? Or it could do 400 like the last couple. I, I, there's, there's no knowing, in my opinion. How important are those two characters, the lovers from the first three? Right. With them being gone, are people going to care? It just, I don't know. It, how important was Gore Verbinski, the director? And that's, it's, I don't know that it's possible to know unless you see the movie and there's something missing. And you're like, oh, okay. I think it was the director. It's interesting because my sister was talking about, I I think this was all the way back before Pirates 3 came out. It was in between Pirates 2 and 3. And she was saying, you know, if they do make a Pirates 4, they really need to wrap up Orlando Bloom and Kira Knightley because they're supposed to be normal people. They're not supposed to be pirates and go out on adventures and they need to finish off their story and then move on to another story so and this is my my sister's not a big movie person or a big story person or any of that kind of stuff and and you know she saw that so maybe lots of people feel that way as well well do you think that this movie will introduce some new potential heartthrob for girls to swoon over or is that supposed to be sparrow because, you know, I've never seen him as playing a particularly attractive character. Right. He's got the funny teeth and the makeup and the weird drunk walk and the awful hair that people find Jack Sparrow attractive is always amusing to me. <laughs> you, you know, kind of in a, you know, it's like, well, we like the character and we like John, the, the guy that plays him. You know? Right. I don't know if they'll bring uh, somebody else in. It seems... From what I've seen, I mean, I haven't really watched the commercials closely or anything like that, but I know there's Penelope Cruz in there, and it seems like she's supposed to be the love interest for Jack. to Jack. I can't think of who it was, but somebody was talking about Pirates 2 and 3 and why they were not as good as Part 1 was. Part 1, they said, was really good because they had their main characters, people that had arcs to go through. You had um, Will Turner... And Elizabeth Swan. Good job. <laughs> it took me some squinting and scrunching of my eyes to make that come out of my brain. But you have those two characters, and they had stuff to learn, stuff to do, and changes to make. And then you had Jack Sparrow, who was like the force of nature or whatever. He was just the pirate that does the pirate things. And he's not going through changes, he's a side character. And he was not the main character. The main characters were Elizabeth and Will. And they did their thing. And But then in the next two, they changed that around. And now Jack Sparrow was the main character. And Elizabeth and Will were these side characters that weren't as important. And the guy was trying to say that that's why these second and third movies weren't as good. is because they didn't resonate with people. Because they didn't have the character arc that they needed. Well, see, that's interesting. I always felt that the flaw with the second and third movie is that it was one script and they, they split it and they stretched it, they splinched it into two <laughs> movies and you could feel them treading water. Uh-huh. But it, that may well be a, a valid point. So we'll have to see in this part four because it seems to me like now they're continuing with that. Jack Sparrow is the main character. We're bringing in love interest for him, but he's the guy. They did something really odd on this. 
which I guess they did on Die Hard 2 or they did on or Die Hard 3, you know, but on Stranger Tides was a book about a woman and her father and a bunch of pirates and Disney took this book and rewrote it with Jack Sparrow and the characters from the Pirates of the Caribbean huh. movies. And so it may be a total disaster <laughs> or it may be more solid because it's got a beginning, middle, and end, right. and an arc and growth and point to all of its characters because it was originally a standalone book. I Again, I don't know. I've not seen it. I've not talked to anybody who has seen it. And if I had, if I knew somebody who had seen it, I wouldn't want to talk to him until I had <laughs> seen it. Do you know if this is a like trilogy that they've got planned already, or is this just kind of a Pirates Part 4 and then Pirates Part 5 is going to be a completely different thing? Yeah, I believe it's just a standalone movie oh, like the first one was. I but expect. hopefully, you know, it'll be successful and they can make more. And there may be things that they sprinkle in there because it's the same writers. It's Rossio and, and it's, it's the same screenwriters from the first three. Uh -huh. And they obviously are in for the long haul. Right. And so. That's interesting. I just assumed that they were uh, doing the same thing. And, and it would be sad if this movie didn't do amazing if they bailed on the series just because of that, you know, it seems like they've got a series on their hands, you know. This isn't a trilogy. This is a Star Trek kind of a thing, a James Bond kind of a thing where you can just have endless adventures with pirates. Well, we'll know that we're effed the day that there is a handsome young replacement character alongside Jack Sparrow where you're like, okay, that's... That's what the was, new Will Turner. What was Mutt's last name in, in Indiana Jones 4? Oh, I don't know what his name was. I, I don't either. But it, like a Mutt Williams character or whatever his last name was in Indiana Jones 4, where it's just like, okay, the second Harrison Ford says, my, my back hurts too much. They're going to be, you know, the adventures of Mutt Williams and the kingdom of the... That's when you know you're the effed. The weird thing about it is, though, is pirates are bad guys. They don't do good things. They are the people that are raping the women they're the people that are killing people just because they want to steal their gold from them kind of a thing and they got away with that in the first movie brilliantly I'm brilliantly right. by making them ghost pirates that can't do any of these things but that's gone away and going and and on top of that not only has that gone away but now the pirates are the good guys somehow. Jack Sparrow is the main character. He's well, the he's the guy. No, more shockingly, Barbosa is now right. a good guy. And to me, that's amazing. I, I like Jeffrey Rush and I liked the character of Barbosa. And so when he sort of became an ally in the, the second, third movie, it was really neat. And it's like, wow, but but you're right. Yeah. How but, how long can they keep on doing this? Pirates are the good guys in the British sailors are the bad guys somehow or some i don't know well we've the, we've got blackbeard in this one and i'm sure that he's just going to be as as evil as sin and and suddenly it's okay to hiss and boo at him and whatever pirates serve him plus the and there's always the supernatural element you had davy jones right even davy jones i felt was sympathetic the, the, yeah they gave him uh, the story that gave you away so like they did with loki you know they made him uh, understandable relatable the only completely vile characters in the Pirates trilogy were the British uh, aristocratic yeah, the tea. paper pushing. Yeah, the India Ink Company or whatever it was. India C Trading Company. Yeah. The that bad guy, super this. robot monkey team. Yeah, that one. Yeah, the monkey team. Wait, undead monkey. <laughs> Uh, okay. Shoot. I think we've run out of time again. We've, we've gone quite long. Like Sting in the sack. Oh, like Sting your tantric? Like Snickers guaranteed to satisfy? Is that how the line goes? I, I really it don't does. like that song. Yeah, I know. You dislike that song. That's why I bring it up to make you angry. <sighs> I wouldn't like you when you're hungry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I don't think we've referenced Oh, that shoot. Well, tune in next week when you just may hear Rish Outfield say... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> tune in next week. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to take a, a, a... We're going to put an end to it for this week again, and we'll, we'll start back up on the same line next time. Good night. See ya. That Gizmigo is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. 
Apparently, the creative in Creative Commons doesn't mean anything.